Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Matt Ingenthrum, and I think we'll go ahead and get started since it's 3 o'clock on the dot. I uh, want to thank uh, everyone for uh, coming this afternoon. I'm really uh, glad to see such a, a good crowd here. We are two sessions away from the end. Uh, and um, they came through and uh, uh, reminded uh, uh, me to tell you that the reward for staying through this session is ice cream. Uh, so, so after, after, so don't leave during the middle. After this session, there's ice cream before the next session. Uh, so uh, that's not the reward specifically for the session, but it, it's uh, it, it, there is a nice uh, social networking opportunity after this. Um, so I'm Matt Ingenthrum. This is my colleague uh, Daniel Templeton from from uh, Cloudera. Daniel. I, I'm Daniel from Cloudera. <laughs> <laughs> you, you summed it up already. We're, Sorry. We're, okay. We're, we're, we're a couple of crew from uh, Sun. We uh, met together a yeah. long time back. Yep. Quite a while back. And so we want to spend a couple of minutes this afternoon uh, talking about how uh, a couple of, uh, or, or actually really how multiple uh, data stores can come together. Um, there have been a couple sessions here on Couchbase already uh, at the conference. I hope those were useful to you. So you probably have a good grounding on Couchbase. Um, I'm, I'll talk about that just very briefly. Uh, chances are you probably all, all heard of what uh, Cloudera works on, uh, Hadoop. Um, and although we'll, we'll give a quick overview of that as well. Um, but frequently, especially if you're new to this environment, you're probably trying to figure out how do, how do these things come together. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in, in this session. So uh, this session is mostly about data storage for polyglots. We'll get to the definition in just a moment. Motivation-wise, really, if you think about it, a lot of the systems that we use today uh, were designed in that era. Well, not exactly for this system. Chances are for, are for bigger uh, systems. But the systems uh, you know, that, that a lot of the, the systems that we've used until the last, really, even five years or so, have all been predicated on, uh, on uh, have all been designed for these other kinds of systems that existed previously. These were typically systems that had extremely limited uh, memory, uh, in many cases, limited storage capacity. Um, very limited I.O. throughput, and, and really couldn't do a lot of complex transformation to really hit their, their usage goals. I mean, if you go far enough back, you would do things like do transformations as you read off tape and stuff like that. It doesn't look like there's anyone that old here in the crowd. Uh, but uh, uh, but the, the main point is that a lot of the systems that we've been using for persistence until recently were really, they've evolved, of course. They've gotten a lot better, uh, but they were really predicated on that architecture. So. Uh, the, the title of this presentation is, uh, is, has a couple of terms in it that I should uh, uh, take a moment to define. First one is polyglot. And so polyglot is a, uh, is a person who knows several languages. Frequently this is heard in conjunction with programming languages. Um, but the term, I think the first person I heard use it was actually Adrian Cockrell. Uh, but uh, it makes sense. Uh, polyglot can also be per uh, applied to persistence. So polyglot persistence, if you're using polyglot persistence, that really means that you're taking the data that underlies your applications, that underlies your business, and using it in multiple systems, each for different purposes. A lot of these systems have different strengths and weaknesses, and it doesn't necessarily make sense in today's modern era to try to do everything with just one single system. Uh, now, reality is, we, as an industry, we've probably done things like this for quite a while. Uh, but it's um, but it's kind of going to an extreme now. So we wanted to talk about one way that a number of these systems have, have come together. Um, if I were to uh, just try to divide up this world of NoSQL, there are lots of different uh, ways I can slice it up. Uh, just a few terms to throw out. There are document store. Couchbase falls into the document store category. There are a couple other players in that, that area. There are column-oriented stores. There are systems that obviously provide uh, uh, ACID um, semantics as you work with the data. Uh, there are systems that uh, apply on different sides of the CAP theorem. I'm sure you've heard that before. Uh, I don't know how many folks are, are new or not to, the, to this whole area. Uh, and then there are even some new terms. Uh, one that was coined not so long ago was BASE. I don't remember exactly what it was. And then there was one that uh, Brian Cantrell had. I should have added that. He called, uh, he called things DIRT. Uh, <laughs> said we have dirty systems. Uh, so there are lots of different persistence systems behind that, that we can choose from today. But these choices don't have to be exclusive of, of one another. 
you can uh, you can choose to use combinations of them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, let me give you just one quick, and we'll talk more about this use case in uh, detail later. Just one quick example of this. Uh, Couchbase uh, as a NoSQL document-oriented, uh, you know, scalable um, NoSQL database. Uh, one of our our, our uh, key capabilities is that we, we do things very, very, uh, very low latency and very high throughput. So we work very well for ad targeting. Uh, so one use case where you might bring multiple things together that are NoSQL systems are uh, an ad targeting platform. Uh, in that particular example, we end up in a scenario where we have a Couchbase server cluster that's spread out across multiple systems. And then maybe we're using something like uh, Hadoop in the, case, in the case of, you know, we, we partnered with Cloudera and we've done some integration work between Hadoop and Couchbase so that people can take data that they're using uh, from the log, or they can take logs from the ad targeting platform and build additional information to be able to use these NoSQL systems together. Uh, we actually do that through something called uh, Scoop. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Danny who's going to talk a little bit more uh, specifically about Hadoop and Scoop. And you can scoop. All right, so uh, let's go to the Apache Hadoop story. All right, so um, I assume, so this is no SQL conference, right? You guys all know everything about Hadoop, right? You're all Hadoop implementers. You can code map reduce in your sleep, right? Yeah, OK. Um, I, I wish, because we would hire you if you could. <laughs> there aren't enough people out there who can do it. We would, if you can, come see me afterwards. We'll hire you. Um, so, so what I'm going to try and do here is like up level it, step back, what is Hadoop, what is Scoop, and, and, and kind of try and keep it a little on the, the higher level. So um, you probably know Hadoop is all about unstructured data and it's about dealing with it scalably, right? And if you're plugged into the cloud era marketing uh, fire hose, you, you're also aware that it's the big data operating system and that we're changing the world one petabyte at a time. So what, the, what does that, any of that mean, right? So it's, it's a couple of adjectives dangling in space. So what is this thing? Um, to, to explain that, we're, we're going to take a step back. And this is actually amusing. Uh, Matt and I developed our slide decks completely independently and did the exact same thing, which <laughs> he started with a trash 80. And I do miss that big orange button. I, I often <laughs> wish I've often wish my system had a big orange button. But um, so. Uh, in explaining Hadoop, let's start with the very, like way back when, or the, the very simple end of things. If you think about a single server deployment, there's CPUs in there, there's disks in there. You can look at this guy as kind of divided up as application and data. And this is just as a single unit, right? And in this space, that makes perfect sense, like you know, when you're doing your demo from your laptop. And I noticed, so the most commonly heard comment I heard from speakers here was, oh my god, I can't believe my entire three-tier NoSQL application is running so well on my MacBook Air. Right? And that's, that's, every one of the presenters said this just about. I don't have a MacBook Air, so I can't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, so you know, when you're running this on your laptop, this is kind of your structure. So what happens when you scale that? Well, you blast out the application side of things. But traditionally, your data, you, know, you don't want to spread your data too much. That starts getting hard. Well, what if you have to? Well, the very traditional answer um, is you bring in a very, very large and expensive, biggest machine possible to, to uh, hold that database, right? Because your data tier doesn't traditionally scale well. Well, then you have the NoSQLs to the rescue. You, you call Couchbase, and now you replace the gigantic Oracle thing with a data grid that mirrors your application grid. This is a very natural paradigm, and it's a very natural growth out of that one system that was compute and data uh, combined. But it's a different path than Hadoop. Hadoop took a different model, which is instead of diversifying or specializing in these are your computes and these are your datas, we just have a lot of computes and datas. Right? So your compute is always local to your data, or at least we try very hard to make sure it's local to your data. Um, it's as local as we can make it be. And this is a really fundamental uh, shift in the way you do computation. So when you hear about how, how amazing and wonderful MapReduce is or how amazing and wonderful Hadoop is, it's usually less about the algorithm and more about the fact that you're not moving data. When you do your computation, you send it to your data 
it happens there in that same space. Right? So that's kind of the, the, the to me, the, the core of what makes Hadoop exciting. So getting back to what I was supposed to talk about, what's Scoop? And I'm, I'm going to, so this is, this is copied off of the uh, scoop.apache.org website. Um, the TLDR is you move data with Scoop. Um, getting into, getting into a, a little more detail, let's do that same thing that we just did for uh, computing and getting to Hadoop. Let's look at ETL and get to Scoop. So if you look at a traditional ETL system, right, you've got data on the left and data on the right and some ETL engine in the middle, right? You suck data from the right, do some kind of transform on it in flight, shove it into your source on the left. Right? This, is, this is what we're all familiar with as an ETL model. When you start talking about Scoop and you start talking about Hadoop, remember, the data is with the compute. So that left side falls off entirely. You're sucking your data from the right and boop, you're just dropping it onto your disk. Right? So you leave half of that, the half of that data transfer behind. Now you, you may have noticed, suck, transform, spit. Suck, spit. Where did the transform go? Uh, well, I'll get back to that. Sorry, I got one slide ahead of myself. And by the way, it's scalable, so you can do this on mass. And this is one of the things that's exciting about Scoop is it's not just about doing this on one node, it's about passing out this sucker, if you will, this code that's going to suck data down from the database and running it on mass across a cluster, which gets you one of two things. It either gets you really high bandwidth data transfer from your database into your cluster, or it gets you a really wicked DOS. <laughs> so back to where did that transform go? Well, in Hadoop, in, in, when Hadoop tends to be commonly used as a, an ETL engine, but it's really not strictly ETL. It's really more ELT. You suck it over, you drop it on your local disk. Now, transform it as much as you want, as, you know, as many times as you want, as many different ways as you want, because your data is local to your compute. Right? You can do these operations very cheaply. You no longer have to insert them midstream while your data is flowing by. You've got your data. It's captive audience. Do whatever you want to it post facto as much as you want. Right? So, and that is what Scoop is about. It's about enabling you to suck out of your database, drop it into Hadoop, and then you do whatever transforms you want. Then you reverse the process. You suck out of Hadoop and you shove it off into your, your database. And uh, there's, so Scoop is, uh, let's see, there's little details. Scoop 1.4 is the current version, which is what's bundled in CDH4. CDH4 is the, the only Hadoop distribution that you need to know about. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Scoop 2.0 will be coming soon. Um, 2.0, uh, you'll see this later in, in Matt's uh, uh, remaining slides. Uh, Scoop is a very command line oriented utility. Uh, it, is as Linuxy as Linuxy could be. There's lots of double dash import this equal da double dash. I, you get a command line that's about four lines long to execute your, your scoop operation. And inexplicably, some people find this thwarting. So with Scoop 2, one of the things they've built is an, a web UI so that you can just point a browser at a URL and say, I want this to happen. Press a button, go. Right, so among the things that Scoop2 brings, that's one of them. Uh, I actually asked uh, one of the committers this morning for a screenshot of that. She said, sorry, we haven't built it yet. Um, but coming soon, <laughs> coming soon to a Scoop near you. Um, and one of the neat things with uh, Scoop is that by default, it uh, plugs in via JDBC. So that covers 90% of what's out there. Um, there's also a slew of custom connectors. So you've got Couchbase, Volt, Vertigo, Teradata, and Tiza, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, et cetera, and Nauseam. Um, the interesting thing is you can use JDBC with most of these guys, so why is there a custom connector? Well, because JDBC tends to not be all that blindingly fast. So for example, with MySQL, we do a MySQL dump and then pick over the MySQL dump as opposed to actually doing uh, a SQL statement against the, the database. Right, so that, that's Scoop in a nutshell, and if we have questions, we'll hit them at the end. Great, thanks. So uh, let me talk a little bit more about uh, some uh, specific use cases, but before I do, I probably should have done this earlier. Let me just kind of get a sense of where people are coming from 
Uh, so this is the, the interactive part. So show of hands, how many folks have, uh, have uh, either uh, tried or have currently deployed Hadoop in, in one way, shape, or form? I'm sure they're all CDH, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, how many folks have tried or deployed uh, something like Couchbase already? Okay, cool, uh, five or six. And then, uh, and, and then just to understand uh, um, maybe on another angle, how many folks are uh, using relational databases and file systems for everything and are here to learn? <laughs> Come on, you can admit it, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so good, uh, a good number of folks, so that's cool. Um, so uh, let, let me actually, because of that, let me pause for questions uh, just for a moment and see, is there anything that we, that, that we need to address to, to bring you up to speed? Uh, on that, does, does uh, what we're talking about here, we explain it in a way that makes sense? Cool, okay, got heads nodding, so that's good. You can get an extra soup of ice cream later if you ask. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that an SQ over P of ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> you get two. <laughs> So I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about uh, some, some key use cases because I think this will help uh, bring the pieces together for you. I'm, I'm sure all of your environments have lots of different disparate data sets and your uh, mind's kind of turning over, how would I use this? Uh, but it's, it's useful, I think, for us to be able to talk about some pretty common deployments. Um, Ad targeting is the one I mentioned earlier. And ad targeting is kind of interesting because, uh, ad, well, number one, it's a very big business. Um, there are uh, a number, of, uh, it's a very competitive industry, and there are a number of companies that, that are all uh, trying to compete for different segments of the ad targeting market. Um, but it also has some very, uh, very intense, very intensely data oriented. One thing that uh, uh, AOL advertising does is they, they actually have their SLA. They, when, when there's that little box of, of what, am I, what am I going to display for the advertisement, uh, they have uh, 40 milliseconds to come up with an answer for what they're going to display in that particular box. Now the challenge is, that's 40 milliseconds to actually decide what to display. Uh, so in order to make that decision on what they're going to decide to display, they need to get a certain amount of data, they need to apply uh, some algorithms to that to be able to make a, a decision. And the better they do, uh, with making that decision, the more likely you're going to click on the ad. I'm sure we've all seen, I always see that in the old days, right, it was, uh, Facebook always had some of the goofy ones where uh, it, their ad targeting is getting better, but you'd see some, why, why are they targeting me with this? Uh, so these, these days, all I see are Hortworks ads. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a friend at Facebook actually told me that, they, uh, that uh, people figured, because uh, with Facebook, you can target people who work for a particular company. Uh, and he said uh, that Facebook employees had gotten targeted by people who wanted a job at Facebook. So that people would buy ad space targeting Facebook employees, which was kind of funny. Um, but uh, I never did that. Maybe some of you did. You're gainfully employed for, or, or, or wealthy from an IPO. I don't know which. Uh, so um, point is, they have that 40 milliseconds to, to respond with a decision. Uh, and so that's not a lot of time. So where well, if, if, even if we were to think about uh, just uh, you know, using a traditional relational database, that's really just not a lot of time to be able to extract that information on, on mass from a system designed to support the whole world, right? These ad targeting systems do need to support uh, very large data sets. Couchbase, because of its design, and I, I can go into some detail if folks are interested later, later uh, we can actually serve up data. Uh, if you're talking about things that fit in a packet, we can serve up uh, data on, across gigabit Ethernet in about 250 microseconds. So if you think about it, that means that uh, I have 40 milliseconds uh, to, to, have to apply that algorithm to that data. If I grab two or three uh, bits of data, I've now spent two or three milliseconds. I now have, I can now spend the remainder of the time uh, with my algorithm, make my algorithm that much better to decide what am I going to display for that particular user. So uh, Couchbase has been in use behind a number of, of different ad uh, targeting and ad retargeting. It's a very interesting uh, competitive industry that I only partially understand. Um, but the, the, the main idea is that they have, over the course of, of uh, their ad targeting, they, they will, in, in many of these cases, they have a few different um, uh, components of data. So one is that they, they generate events. They generate a lot of events. As people visit the different, different pages, they uh, generate events associated with that user profile. 
uh, that user profile um, then gets stored, but uh, may also be used directly with Couchbase. So they may write those events to Couchbase over the course of the day and use that over the course of the day. No ice cream for her. They also will then generate profile, different profiles on those users and campaigns associated with those users. Uh, so uh, our campaigns associated with the, their customers who are targeting ads. Um, so of the people who visited the site, from the events I've seen, I build up a profile. Now I have an ad campaign based on what my advertisers or what my clients are willing to pay to profile or to target different profiles. All of that data needs to get loaded back into something that I can use at runtime to be able to hit that 40 millisecond SLA. Uh, so the, in, in the case of uh, generating the events, the, the front end will put those either into Couchbase or Hadoop, or in some cases, both. Uh, and then we'll, they'll uh, generate the profiles and campaigns, for typically in, in running a set of really heavy lifting Hadoop not produce jobs, are frequently chains of these jobs, things that uh, Daniel can program in sleep. Uh, and then uh, load that data right back into Couchbase for being able to sort that out to the users. So, have, have you seen the uh, quote from Jeff Hum Humberbacher? It says, the uh, best minds of our generation are uh, figuring out how to make people click on little pop up ads. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, there was a Will Wheaton, uh, did you see that one? There was a Will Wheaton, uh, I think it was a tweet the other day, who, yeah, I think Will Wheaton, who was uh, Wesley from uh, uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation, right? he, he said he turned off uh, JavaScript for about 30 seconds and discovered that, the, uh, that most of the web, uh, that without it, uh, most of the, the most of what JavaScript is doing on the web is trying to figure out how to do pop-unders, uh, <laughs> display ads, and what was it? It's, it's worth looking up, so it was kind of funny. Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit more about a very specific use case. So I talked, talked about um, uh, AOL briefly. Uh, so these slides are actually directly from AOL. So uh, uh, the architect over there, Paro, had uh, shared these, and actually a subset of this was, uh, or I'm sorry, a superset uh, one I'm going to talk about here was actually presented here at uh, NoSQL now last year where I, I talked more about this case in detail. So I'll just cover a, a high level uh, piece of it because I do want to get on to one other use case. So uh, at AOL, um, AOL uh, adopted Couchbase uh, initially for their ad targeting and then they, they worked through how they could uh, build out new sets of uh, products in their environment. AOL built what uh, they term a real-time framework for their, um, for their uh, ad targeting. Um, this system has, has since uh, evolved from, from here, uh, but this is uh, just a, a quick uh, overview of their real-time framework. Uh, so they actually, uh, at the time, they were feeding data in through Flume. Some of that has actually changed uh, since then, but they, they would uh, feed data in, in, a, in a regular on a more of a 15-minute burst. Once that data is loaded, it's then used as sort of a read-only staging um, before it, it's uh, run by the different compute jobs. Depending on the job, uh, it may actually be uh, either written, so now at this stage, at this point, the data is actually in a, uh, a Couchbase backend cluster. Depending on the job, uh, the data may actually flow into uh, Hadoop, where they're going to do a lot of other additional heavy lifting in developing those user profiles. Or it may flow back over to directly, back over to the front end for ad serving logic. Uh, and since this is done in, uh, on, a, on a regular basis in their environment, they're able to, over the course of the day, actually change that profile for the user. So as you're clicking your way through the site or various sites, because you never actually know who's doing the ad targeting behind a particular page. It might be ad targeted or ad retargeting. It's a very interesting industry. Um, you'll, you'll see that they have a, a number of different uh, approaches to be able to, uh, to uh, gather that data, build that profile, and then serve it straight back over in a real-time fashion. Um, one specific example is what they call contextual uh, segmentation. Uh, in, in, their, in this specific use case, you'll see that there's a, a user, content, user to content ID mapper. And this is all run out of uh, their, their own sort of proprietary system that will uh, 
create based on an, the active event frame, the user context map, uh, the, uh, and some other data, uh, the user segment mapper, et cetera. They'll, they'll uh, run that off to other systems outside of Hadoop to be able to uh, generate that data and build that profile. That data then goes directly back over to CapTrace where it's then used live real time for uh, ad serving. Uh, so in, in that environment, they'll, they'll be able to very quickly, uh, over the course of the day, just continually ingest the data, uh, update profiles based on the updated profiles, push that straight back out to the front end system, and then target uh, individual users with uh, individual data. There, now, there are, um, uh, there's also a user segmentation long-term map that, that lives in Hadoop. And so this is really where, this is uh, sort of short term over the course of the day, I'm rebuilding uh, the profile, but there's also a section here where they build a, a long-term profile uh, of that user and they do their user segmentation in that uh, long-term map. That too lives in Hadoop. Uh, so they'll do daily map updates and event-based updates for that. So with that, I want to uh, probably talk about one other, but before that, um, I, we, we, we I probably should have uh, described this a little better in slides, but it's worth discussing how does this actually happen. Uh, in the case of Scoop, what will happen is you will, uh, you'll, and you'll see it in a bit, it's a very simple command line tool. It's really just a matter of, as, as Daniel says, it's simple, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's simple after we did the, <laughs> the integration work, right? Um, uh, the, the neat thing is that I've seen a couple of these environments, not uh, AOL, but one other customer. They had a, a I think it was an 18 node uh, um, Couchbase cluster and a 20 node Hadoop cluster. And it was pretty neat to see those, for those who haven't seen uh, Couchbase, we have a really nice graphical UI of what's happening operationally inside the system. At deployment, when you would ask Scoop to go ahead and move a set of data from one side to the other, and it is bi-directional, uh, export and import, uh, they would, uh, we would see that, uh, that spike up to about 3 million operations a second. The reason that happens is that the quick little scoop command line is really not um, uh, directly executing there in that little shell. Uh, it's really creating a set of MapReduce jobs that end up getting deployed out to the Hadoop cluster and run as separate mappers and reducers. Uh, the scoop connector itself and the work that we've done will automatically split that up into whatever makes sense for the, the individual cluster. So that really means in parallel, what we had was uh, 20 uh, Hadoop nodes uh, trying to shove data into 18 nodes of Couchbase as fast as possible, uh, as fast as it, it would allow. And it, work, uh, it works out uh, quite well. So uh, with that, let me talk a little bit about another uh, set of use, uses, and that's uh, really content and recommendation targeting. So uh, the other place that uh, Couchbase ends up getting frequently deployed for um, uh, sort of the, the uh, data store behind an application are a number of content sites. Companies like The Knot, Navtech, NHN, Vimeo, uh, even Mozilla and Salesforce use Couchbase behind uh, their sites. Uh, in many cases, a lot of these sites are, are actually, uh, they, they actually have applications that have been around for quite a while. They're content-oriented sites. It depends on who it is, of course. Um, but those content-oriented sites, like NHN is one of our early partners that's uh, the, the next human network. And they're basically, they're, they're effectively known uh, in the US as the Google of Korea. So they're uh, very large in, uh, in Korea. Uh, and they have uh, Couchbase behind a number of their, their uh, content sites. So um, they had a lot of, many of these apps have been around for a long time and had traditionally used a relational database. But as, as the requirements for that application have grown, and as, especially as user demands for that data have grown, they need to be able to keep pace with the throughput and also uh, hit the better response times that users expect now as they want to roll out new applications to mobile devices, et cetera. So what's happening in many cases is that they'll take these uh, content-oriented sites, or Orbitz is actually another one, and they will uh, they'll continue to use the relational database, but they'll also start to build out new portions of those applications on something like Couchbase as a document-oriented database that can handle the throughput and latency that they need for those new requirements. So now that, that same old application is using um, 
well, it's not really the same old application. A, modern, a, a newer version of that application continues to use that relational database, so they still have the same data that they've been using for quite a while. They can still use a lot of those rich capabilities of that relational database, but because of some of the limitations and because of the way it was originally designed, um, it's very hard to scale that thing out. It's very hard to hit these new demands. So that's where they'll, continue, they'll start to use casualties. Uh, in these um, content and uh, content with, re with recommendation targeting kinds of sites, it's, it's actually, I guess, I never thought about it this way, but it's sort of incestuous. The reason people do content and re uh, or recommendation targeting if you're a content-oriented site is because you're trying to keep people on the site longer. The reason you're trying to keep people on the site longer is so that you can target them with more advert advertisements. <laughs> so uh, the, the two are actually uh, reasonably related. Um, but they, uh, they as well will have a large number of events that frequently will go uh, directly into Hadoop. And they as well will, will continue to build um, not only user profiles, but also in many cases, the very specific content that they want to target to very specific users. And when I uh, say that, they'll, they'll actually frequently build that out to, to the extent that it's even rendered HTML. So it's, it's a, a, it, might, it, it likely exists as a JSON document sitting in Couchbase that is a subset of what's going to get rendered and directly sent up to the user uh, so that they can uh, deliver that kind of throughput that's needed. Now, at the same time, that relational database that might be used behind that application, they want to use that data in something like Hadoop to build out those user profiles as well, or build out additional uh, targeting for that application. So as new, as the site is uh, further developed or you know, new content is deployed, that needs to go in here as well so that you know what assets are available to be able to uh, target in, in an individual uh, use case. So just to see how the, what the moving parts are, uh, in, in that uh, particular uh, scenario. If I do have that sort of content-driven site, I have that original RDBMS, and I probably have that Couchbase server cluster, this uh, web application that's developed internally uh, in, in their environment is uh, obviously interacting with that RDBMS, which might be something like MySQL, um, might be Oracle, et cetera. And it's also interacting directly with that Couchbase cluster, depending on what it's serving up. It's trying to serve up a recommendation. Now, as they as users interact with that site, it's also generating typically just lots of log data. And this is data that, that historically we've had for a lot of these kinds of applications, but we've honestly we've thrown it away, or we didn't treat it as things that could be uh, what was the term? Big data. The big data operations? Petabyte, no, no. Oh, the petabyte. Yeah, there it is. So now, now we, so we've, we've been throwing away petabytes of data that we could have been changing the world with. So now, now we have an opportunity to capture that data and efficiently really understand it by uh, being able to take a set of that content that might run as a scoop import from that original RDBMS into uh, something like a Hadoop cluster. Uh, as well as have this round tripping of being able to pull data uh, from, uh, from Scoop. In some cases, people don't necessarily have this leg of taking data out of Couchbase. It depends on where they're keeping their user session data. Um, frequently, we've seen a lot of deployments where people do start to use uh, Couchbase for session data. But they'll have that round trip where they'll pull that data into Hadoop as well. And this is where a lot of the heavy lifting occurs to then uh, export back to, if you will, the operational system that is behind the site. So in this case, uh, we're actually able to use Scoop as a common tool to be able to move data between these different systems. So Scoop actually stands for SQL to Hadoop, if I remember correctly. Um, although, ironically, the first uh, certified connector that wasn't you know, just a default JDBC one was for no SQL system, it was Couchbase. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, we went through that work. Uh, together to, to pull those pieces together. So Scoop allows us to pull together the different pieces and then run that, uh, run the different kinds of uh, uh, algorithms at, at the uh, Hadoop level across that data. And since I know you're just all dying to know the way the, the, the logs get into Hadoop is another project called Schloom, um, which is all about transferring streaming log data into to Hadoop. So Hadoop kind of ends up, I like to call it the data, the, the, your da big data petri dish. Right, so it's a place where you snake everything and you see what grows out, right? Um, <laughs> but but it, it is it's that kind of bridging element 
And uh, by the way, FUM is included in ZDH4, the only uh, bit of distribution you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so just briefly, uh, let's uh, look at what moving the data itself, uh, how, what the process there is. Um, at this stage, if I were using Scoop uh, from a, uh, from, um, to import data, right? an import is really, to Scoop, an import is all about bringing it into Hadoop. Uh, this is actually uh, as simple as it needs to be. All I need to do is specify, in the world of Couchbase, we actually uh, we distribute the cluster configuration through, uh, through REST, through a REST uh, comment stream. And so really all I need to do is specify uh, where, where is the cluster, just one node of the cluster. I don't have to worry about all 18. I just say, you know, here's, here's one node of the cluster. And I can uh, specify if I want to dump that data. In the case of Couchbase, there are a couple other parameters if I wanted to get into a specific bucket, things of that nature. Buckets are analogous to databases in the world of Couchbase. Whoops. Uh, I may also choose, uh, sort of, which is sort of interesting, I may also choose, and there are a couple scenarios where this has been used, where, to do what's called a backfill. And, the, and a backfill differs from a dump in that a backfill will connect to a cluster for a brief period of time and get a copy of all of the data changes that are occurring on that cluster without actually dumping all of the data off that cluster. So by doing this, I can actually sample over the course of the day. So backfill underscore five is a way of saying, I would like to dump the data that's coming, or sorry, backfill, um, uh, uh, or sample a certain subset of the data. As it's getting modified in Couchbase, I'm going to import that into the loop, and I can do that just for that five minute period of time. So I may have, effectively a crumb job or other ways of scheduling that. I'm sure there's another way to schedule that. Uh, Uzi. Uh, Uzi, which is a project included in CDH4, <laughs> the only good distribution you know about. So uh, I, I, may, uh, I may run that job on a regular basis to sample what's actually happening in my environment. Maybe there's certain critical points during the day when I want to get that, when I want to do that sampling, since it affects uh, uh, certain kinds of user profiles. The opposite is actually rather easy. Uh, so it's, it's really an export. It's really a question of just specifying where your cluster is and that you're going to dump uh, that data and what are you dumping it into. What's the, uh, uh, what is the, in this case, the exporter is the, um, is the uh, directory in HDFS that you're, you're exporting. And so it may actually look relatively simple because it looks like I'm just moving some data around within a system. Uh, but reality is behind each one of the, those command executions, a MapReduce job is generated, distributed through the cluster, uh, and then it uh, will directly, it'll split up the data and decide how to, uh, uh, how to most efficiently move it over to the Couchbase cluster. And, and this is also simple because none of the new connectivity uh, <coughs> options are in here because you can tell that through the command line variables. So the you know, Hadoop home is set here, Hadoop comforter is right. set here, right? So all the stuff that tells it what Hadoop cluster are you connecting to and where you find it, where's the data, that's all just implicitly in environment variables that were the previous 10 lines that. <laughs> Correct, yeah. Although frequently that's just something that people set yeah, up it ahead is. of time. Uh, that uh, you, you don't actually end up interacting with on a, on a regular basis. Um, the, uh, the way that you specify which bucket is, is actually relatively simple. It's through usernames and passwords. So those are just uh, additional arguments to, to the uh, scoop tool itself. Uh, so I, I know this was a pretty high level overview, and, and that, that's uh, certainly what we have. I can go into some more detail. Um, but if you're interested in quite a bit more detail about either catchphrase base or uh, how Catchbase and uh, Hadoop are used together in a couple of different environments, uh, especially if you're here local. Uh, we do actually have an event coming up uh, uh, in next month, CouchConf in San Francisco, uh, where we're going to have a, a number of, uh, there are three separate tracks and there are a number of other um, use cases that we'll describe. We have a number of companies that are coming in to show how they use it in their environment. McGraw Hill is actually, I uh, can't talk too much about it at this point, but after, in about a month we'll be able to talk quite a bit more about it. It's a pretty interesting content oriented. Um, so with that, uh, questions? It's a relatively, yeah? I have a question about just besides real time. Besides games, like they have the size of real time ad service, service things, are, are there any other 
Uh, well, so the, the third I would be the one I mentioned, which is really content-oriented sites. Um, the, the other that we've, uh, that we've seen in a, a few uh, different situations, we've seen financial, uh, some financial deployments, especially where people are doing, um, it turns out a lot of financial deployments have many of the same patterns, right? They're trying to re recommend different products to their users, and they have this, a lot of the same web uh, aspects. I'm sorry. No, I was just thoroughly agreeing with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> financial would be one. Uh, the other one that has come up uh, um, uh, relatively uh, frequently has been manufacturing. Um, so um, we've even seen a few situations where people are, are applying uh, the, the big data, the kinds of things that you might do with big data to uh, gathering metrics during uh, production process and using that to feed back in uh, the loop uh, later or long term understand what's happened. One, uh, one other sort of funny uh, deployment was, uh, uh, and I, unfortunately I can't say exactly who they are, but they're, a, um, they're actually an appliance manufacturer. And so they're getting uh, their appliances, uh, when the service folks go out in the field, they get different data from these appliances and uh, it'll get uh, fed back into the system. And then they'll use that to, uh, to understand or predict what's going to happen with those the systems in the field. Uh, so I, I, I remember earlier today, I don't know if he's in the room, I don't think he is, I was talking with a gentleman who's with, a, um, uh, who is one of the railroads, and uh, he had a really interesting, so apparently they take these high resolution images of trains as they go by, and then they, they keep that data. They don't necessarily know what they're going to do with it yet, uh, because then a failure will occur later, and they can go back and look at how did that failure come to happen. So at what point you know, they, they can go back and use those images. And he said in their environment, uh, what that allows them to do is to better predict uh, how they have to service uh, a train. And it turns out it's a lot easier to service it if you do it before it fails. Uh, so <laughs> you know, if it's blocking a track, it's not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, so they need to. They, so that was uh, another environment. So there are lots of different uses. I, I would actually be kind of interested to hear what. Uh, and so that's where this conference is very good from my perspective because it's interesting to hear how this applies to other businesses that we haven't traditionally dealt with. Like, so and how how are you guys in uh, say like telco or government? You know, so like one of one of the big use cases I would think this would play well to your strengths is you know your cell phone is reporting lots and lots and lots of data. And of course, they would never look at that data or do anything useful with it. No, of course not. Um, and Hadoop wouldn't be a great way to do that. You know, right? so, <laughs> right, so I would imagine that. No, ad targeting is pretty big brother already. Right? It, it, yeah, <laughs> so. well, exactly. Well, I mean, it, it all ultimately comes down to ad targeting, right? Click on the, click on the silly little ads and make them happy. Um, is, is that a use case that you guys? Um, it, it's, I, I can't say that I've. Uh, Dealt specifically with government. Telco has been one, uh, although frequently they're pretty careful about how they use that data. I do remember one was really about um, actually emergency response, and in that case, they were trying to deal with regulatory requirements of being able to very quickly understand uh, what uh, what data is behind. You know, when somebody hits nine one one, okay, I need to know which cell towers they've been at previously. And that was really about trying to hit specific regulations, uh, but I. Any other questions? Nope, great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, by all means, uh, come up and grab us if you have any other questions. And otherwise, uh, yes. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, there should be ice cream. <laughs> Thanks for your time.